Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Today, it's just me and writer Christopher Smith. All week, we've been arguing about the Mustang Mach-E, an electric crossover unveiled by Ford last weekend to compete with the upcoming Tesla Model Y and other new EVs entering the market. The fact that Ford has used the Mustang name for this vehicle, though, is a bit much for some, like my co-host, to swallow. I, however, think it's a stroke of brilliance. It's editor versus editor on this week's episode. Chris, welcome to the podcast. John, I just want to say it's happy. I'm happy to be here. You're my friend. We're still going to be friends after this. We're going to be friends after we're, this. We're going to yeah. be friends after this. We'll, we'll let everybody know that right up front. It, it hasn't felt like that sometimes in our chat room uh, this past week because we have gotten into uh, some serious back and forth about this car, this name, using it. And uh, this is the first time, though, we've actually spoken out loud about it, not, not in a chat room. So I'm really excited to um, put this to bed. Although I will see at the end of the, the show if either of us convince the other. It's, it, it'll, be a, it'll be a good talk. It'll be a good talk. It'll be a good talk. All right. So let's, I want to set the stage because we have actually a pretty interesting coincidence. Why don't you tell, <laughs> why don't you tell the audience what, uh, what car do you drive? A Mustang. <laughs> okay, why don't you ask me the what, same question? John, what car do you drive? I drive a Tesla. Okay. So I I feel like uh, we were kind of born into the camps that we're in, in terms of this debate. Uh, it, and, but that's good, because I think we both know our side as well as anyone who can argue it. I would certainly agree with that. And I mean, we both have, uh, we both have strong opinions on this, on both sides. I just need to say that uh, I don't really consider myself the typical Mustang owner that, uh, you know, mine's a little bit older. It's a 95. It's a project car. It doesn't get driven all the time, but I throw snow tires on it and drive it in the winter. Um, I'm not afraid of electric power that's coming. So it's and, and, and I will say, as the week has gone on, I've softened a little bit. I've softened oh. a little bit on my stance, but not. Yeah, no, this is I feel we're, like you're, you're we're, we're still going to we're still going to throw it down here. You're unveiling a soft spot for me to attack. OK, well, I, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I also feel like I'm not the typical Tesla fanboy. I certainly like the company and I bought the car because I think it's great, but I don't think everything Elon Musk does is perfect. I don't think that, you know, Tesla is the be all end all. And I like when other companies uh, like Ford try to come out with a great electric product. And I, I, I think the Mach-E is, is the best um, EV to come along and challenge Tesla to date. So, um, so yeah, I think we, we both kind of have an open mind. Now, on your side of the debate about using the Mustang name for the Mach-E, there's already a petition started by a friend of the website, Jimmy Dinsmore, um, who is a Mustang expert. He's written books on the Mustang um, and he writes about it a lot. He already has a petition going to change the name to something else. Uh, let me ask, what is the what is the petition up to? Do you happen to Ooh, have it handy? You know what? I, I, I don't have that handy. I could probably pull it up really quick. I know when we when we wrote the article on it, um, it was actually just about 24 hours ago we wrote that article on it. And it was, it's, I think, about... Actually, I think I was number 900 on that uh, on that petition and I'm bringing it up right now. Uh, a few hours after that, it had almost doubled. And let's I see here. I kind of feel, though, right now, to make... Yeah, tell us what it is, if you can pull it up. Uh, 4,000? Nope, oh. nope, nope, nope. 5,630. Oh. 31. That's actually... 32. Uh... <laughs> 33, oh, wow. You're 34, 35. Time? Yeah, it's, Shoot. Oh, wow. it's, a, it's, it's getting some traction. What number do you think it would have to reach to make Ford take it seriously? It's it's not gonna. There's no number. hundreds. There, there's hundreds no of thousands. There's no number that will that will make Ford change its course on this. You 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 say that, and before we get into our debate, we should point out. You you may reference this in your debate, but there was a time when Ford had plans to replace the Mustang with what would eventually become the Ford Probe. You know what what the Probe became was going to be our next generation Mustang, and word got out, and there was such a negative reaction that Ford actually reversed this decision and decided to continue on with a Fox body Mustang for a while longer. So there is precedent of Ford changing its mind when making a decision about the, the Mustang brand and what the Mustang will be. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I think a, a fair amount of people know that story. What uh, what people don't necessarily realize 
that's the reason really the Fox platform went on so long in the Mustang. I mean, it was it was kind of the running joke through the 1990s and into the early 2000s, you know, with the various publications to say, oh, yeah, the Mustang with its Fox platform going back to 1979. Well, yeah, Ford was going to actually can the Mustang there in the late 80s. And you're right. The outcry was so strong that Ford said, "Okay, well, maybe we better not do this. And well, and it was either live on with the rear wheel drive. 10 year old Fox body platform or accept the switch to front wheel drive, which it sounds like that was the, the step too far that, was, that Mustang uh, enthusiasts couldn't handle. Definitely. That was the step too far. And you know, there's even a more recent president of that. If you remember John, when Ford first announced that they're going to come out with this electric crossover, it was called the Mach one and the Mach one has a very storied history uh, throughout the Mustangs past you know back in the late 60s and then when they brought it back uh in 2003 and there was tremendous outcry on that and ford reversed its course and said okay well it won't be called the mach one the it's difference funny because i i feel like mustang enthusiasts would be happy with the just the mach one name being used and not the mustang name i i think they would have taken that as a um compromise at this point uh but they were pretty shocked when the car debuted last weekend and the must not only was the Mustang name attached, I mean, it, it is the Mustang Mach E. It is not the Mach E. It is the Mustang Mach E. And there's not a Ford badge on the car. the The Mustang uh, horse is dead center in the in the grill. Um, so yeah, really, I, I I think Mustang enthusiasts would rather take that back uh, than complaining about just the Mach One. And if if the if the Mustang name uh, wasn't going to be used, that that would be. I mean, well, we've already seen that's. I think that's just as upsetting because the Mach One. I, I mean, Mustang has been in various forms, you know, as far as four cylinder or six cylinder. Sure, M- Mach One was always just the straight up muscular V eight you know, shaker hood, here's some power, you know. Um, yeah. Okay, well, you know, save, I, I think there was a Mach 1 variant in the in the, in the the later 70s. But the, Well, know, I think, the, the, did you like then the twist on the Mach 1 name with Mach E? Yes, I like it very much because it draws on that Mustang history that Ford is so keen to try to sell this vehicle with without really stepping on the history. It's the Mach-E. It's a brand new model. And it, I mean, that makes total sense to me. And So you, you think that they should have just done that without using the Mustang name or the horse badge? You this, know? you know, even, even the horse badge, I don't think I would have quite as much trouble with because Ford all along, when this first came out, when they first started talking about this, Ford said, it's Mustang inspired. It's Mustang inspired. It's Mustang inspired. I'm still a little confused as to why they said Mustang inspired all this time. And then once they finally revealed it, oh, it's not Mustang inspired. We're calling it Mustang. And and just having, just having this be the Ford Mach-E, I think would accomplish the exact same goal that Ford is trying to do with this. And and I get it. They're trying to garner some of that Mustang pedigree and market this has an exciting, fun to drive uh, electric crossover, which electric crossovers generally aren't billed right now as fun to drive or exciting. But, well, and also, there aren't really that many out there. So Ford, I you know, they see themselves as, oh, maybe we can step in Sure. And, and try to grab some attention. So I feel like you're you're already getting into your arguments. Before you go too far, yeah. I want to, for, for those who haven't been following uh, the Maki's introduction, I want to go through some of the, the salient points about it so everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. So what the Maki is, is, is it's sort of a compact-sized four-door hatchback slash crossover. That's kind of the vehicle type, uh, if you can picture that in your head. It is all electric with battery sizes that provide ranges of between 230 and 300 miles, uh, which is very competitive. Um, To hit that 300 mile mark is very difficult. And so far, Tesla has been the only one to even get above, I think, 270 uh, in terms of range. Um, zero to 60, uh, depending on the model you get ranges from 5.5 seconds, uh, which is the slowest to 3.5 seconds for the fastest, which is the Mach E GT. Actually, John, uh, I got to jump in really quick because the slowest is actually mid six second range. Oh, did I get the wrong mid six second? Okay. Thank you. I, I, I see um, you're trying to stack the deck. It's all right. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll see. Um, all right. Uh, rear wheel drive or all wheel drive is available. Um, and of course with all wheel drive, there's a, there's a hit to range as is usual with, uh, with electric cars. Um, I would say it's clearly aimed directly at the Tesla model Y, which is a similar type vehicle that isn't available yet. Uh, but it's kind of like the, the, the taller crossover version of the very popular Tesla model three. Uh, the interior of the Mach-E is pretty wild, uh, especially for a Ford. It's got a giant 15 and a half inch uh, screen, uh, vertically oriented. Um, it's got another screen in front of the driver. Um, and so it really departs, I think, from most of Ford's normal passenger cars with some very innovative and forward thinking uh, design inside. Uh, the pricing, I would say the pricing undercuts similar electric vehicles from German automakers um, like the e-tron, um, the EQC from Mercedes, uh, the i from Jaguar. Um, and those vehicles actually have worse specifications in terms of range. Um, so that is a nice um, advantage for the Ford. Uh, it's priced from the low $40,000 range to $60,000 for the Mach-E GT, which is the fastest. Plus, since Ford hasn't sold that many EVs, uh, the company still has its full um, number of of federal tax rebates, um, and those equal seventy five hundred dollars. So if you buy a Mach E, you get um, you still get a seventy five hundred dollar tax credit, um, and that makes a big difference, especially when you're comparing the prices to say when the Model E comes out. Tesla does not have that rebate anymore because it sold so many electric cars. Um, now you will have to wait a little while for a Mach E. Um, they're taking pre-orders now. You can put down a $500 uh, refundable deposit, but they're not going to start arriving until closer to the end of 2020. And those will be the more expensive versions, like there's a first edition and a, and a premium version um, that I think they're selling first. So um, that kind of sets the stage about what the, the vehicle we're talking about. And I think, is it fair to say we both agree that the vehicle itself seems like a really good um, effort and and product from Ford for entering the electric vehicle space. Yes. Is that fair to say? Oh, okay. yes. And, and I'm very glad that you uh, gave us that lengthy description because, yes, I think, honestly, I think it's a fantastic vehicle. It really yeah, is. I, 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 not, I not only think that it matches um, the Model Y kind of spec for spec, but I also think it is gorgeous. I think it's a great design. Um, even if you took the kind of Mustang design cues off of it, and I would say the the strongest Mustang cues it has is the face mm -hmm. and and the tail lights. The tail lights, uh, absolutely. Yeah. If if you took those off, um, it wouldn't really have any Mustang influence at all, but it would still look gorgeous. Um, you know, the Model Y and Tesla's design aesthetic is very very minimal, very, very aerodynamic. And this just has a lot of personality, a lot of curves, um, and it looks fantastic. So I think they did a really good job on the design. But... I think they did a great job on the design. Um, you know, that big screen in the middle seems kind of awkward, but I mean, that's also the, the trend. That's the way things are going. I think the interior looks great. I think the statistics, as far as the performance, the range, I mean, well, like you said, they're good. They're competitive. They're not blowing anything out of the water, but they are certainly right there at the top of their class, which, I mean, this segment is still, I mean, this is still a small segment, but Ford has positioned itself with this vehicle to be a real contender. I mean, I put it, I, I, I would go farther. I think, you know, Tesla in terms of range uh, of their EVs of this size EV are so far ahead of the competition, the particularly the German automakers I just mentioned, and even the Chevy Bolt, um, that Ford is really the first one to match the the ranges that tesla is quoting for the model y and that tesla already achieves with the model 3 so i think it's a really big step um, i think that the maki -E isn't perfect uh, in terms of its um specifications i think it has a somewhat slower uh, charge speed um, high, uh, um, than the Teslas and some other vehicles. Um, so when you do get to a high speed charger charging station on the highway, it's not going to charge quite as fast. Um, I also think the the it has a for so it has two battery sizes, like I said, and they're both large. the 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 larger of the two is ninety eight point eight kilowatts, um, um, which is 
a really large battery pack. And so they're getting 300 miles of range out of that with the rear wheel drive model. But uh, to give you an example, the, the Model 3 iDrive has something like uh, a battery in the high 70 kilowatt range, and it goes over 300 miles. Mm-hmm. So but right now, t- Tesla is still, um, to me, still seems to be able to get more, it, it has a more efficient powertrain that's getting more out of smaller batteries. I mean, there's a there's an edge there. And I mean, I, th- I think the Model 3, it's fair to say, is a fair amount smaller than uh, than the Mach-E. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's... Yeah, I but the Model it's, it's Y be, won't. Right. won't be. The Model Y will be very similar to the to the Mach-E. And even it, it, is, it is going to use the same batteries as the Model 3. And it'll have the same 300-mile range with a much smaller battery than the Mach-E. So I, I don't know that that's a... That's a um, a knock on the Mach E because all it means is that Ford is paying for a larger battery. Um, it, you're still you, you're, but you're only getting the same range uh, for that large size. So I, I don't know if, if that cost doesn't reach the consumer, maybe that's fine. Um, but so I don't know how much much of a knock well, to give it. But. I mean, the the larger battery, there's going to be a penalty in size and weight. Right. Size and weight, yeah. So, so let, let's let's get into. You already kind of started with yours, but let me let's let me hear your couple big points about why yes. you think using the Mustang name is bad, a well, bad idea. I mean, I'll start by saying everything we've talked about thus far. You know, we've talked about how it compares to Tesla, its EV range, its performance. None of that matters. I'm going to just come right out and say none of that matters because this vehicle is not the simple basic formula that has been Mustang for 55 years. It's the whole talk of electric and performance. It's a red herring. The big issue here with this being called Mustang is that it's not a two door two plus two pony car with the low slung hood driving just the rear wheels. Can I, can I bring up a counterpoint though? Because it, while it's not apples to apples, I feel like it's similar with what happened to Porsche when they launched uh, the Panamera and the Cayenne, and they expanded their portfolio of cars outside of sports cars. Yeah, that's and, that, that's fine, but did they call it a 911? No, but they called it a Porsche, and yeah. that's why it's not apples to apples, but for forever, Porsche had only been sports cars of various types. It had never been anything but that. Well, imagine, then, but imagine, John, if... If Porsche had come out with that and said, hey, check out the new four door 911. I mean, could you imagine how broken the Internet would have become with that? I mean, but, I mean that's but, really what we're talking about here. I, 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 I think you're well, I, I think you're making it kind of two apples to apples. I think the reaction. How could you to, be two apples? to well, apples? well, let me let me put it this way. It's too perfect it of way. a comparison. There were, just like there are Mustang enthusiasts complaining about using the Mustang name on this car, there were Porsche enthusiasts complaining about using the Porsche name on an SUV or a four-door. And and I felt like there was a similar amount of, of fervor and argument and uh, back then. But since then, I think everyone would agree that uh, launching the Porsche SUV and the Porsche four-door did not hurt the automaker. And in fact only helped it and has helped secure the futures of those very sports cars that people were arguing were the only things that could ever be called uh, Porsches. Right. So, I, mean, I mean, you're not wrong there, but as you said, I mean, that's not that's not an apples to apples comparison. That's not what we're talking about here. Ford is the, the company. Porsche is the company. Under Ford, there are various models, different brands. Under Porsche, there are various models, different brands. Porsche never had. Porsche was always just about simple, basic, fun cars, sports cars. They understood, as I'm sure every single automotive mining person in the world right now has understood, SUVs sell. And to further the company, obviously they're in the business to make money, if they create some different sub-brands here, Call them something other than what they're known for. Hey, you know what? It, it upsets some Porsche people, but that's evolution of a company. What we're talking about here is the dilution of a specific brand, of, of a specific model. I, but, but to me, I think it, it applies because it is about, it's both about the evolution of a company and about the evolution of a model. It's not that it's not that a company has to be selling an EV today because so many are being sold and, and you know, it's not, it's not like making an SUV just to cash in on something. However, every automaker recognizes that the day of the EV is fast approaching and that all of them have to get in the space. 
And I think what Ford's what Ford did was say, we want to come out with the the vehicle that is going to to make the biggest impact in terms of us setting the stage for our future. And it it drew on the Mustang to do that. Well, I um, I don't know. See, uh, okay. If Ford had come out with an electric Mustang, like a proper two plus two, two door, that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna harp on this because throughout Mustang's history, different engines have come and gone, different body styles have come and gone. And when I say body styles, I'm talking, uh, you know, like a two door sedan, you know, like a notchback five o uh, Fox body, or you know, the, the so the, 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 uh, but that's let's 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 acknowledge uh, your point right there that the Mustang shape did change a couple times the, the, in terms of the, the shape type. yes the shape has changed obviously you're going to have different designs i mean the ford not, still not built... by design but you're talking about you know vehicle type slight changes i'll grant you it's but... yeah okay you're you're really starting to split hairs here, all right John. Hey, come on if we're in if we're in a courtroom it's that's valid evidence <laughs> okay the, then then i'll break it down simply like this again 55 years the basic mustang formula has always been two doors Two plus two, two seats in front, two seats in the back, pony car driving the rear wheels. This Mustang Mach E is a four door, technically five door, once you include the hatch, five seater crossover that's not really low slung that offers all wheel drive as well as rear wheel drive. By just strict definition, it does not fit the definition of Mustang. And that's and that's where I have my real complaint. If Ford wanted to come out with an electric Mustang and they had a two door, two plus two pony car turning just the rear wheels with an electric motor, awesome. I'm gonna go on record as saying that will be awesome. And they did technically debut that at SEMA a few weeks earlier. Yep, the, the, I mean the there lithium. was the, there was that concept, but the and that's why I say electric power in this instance, it's a red herring. It doesn't matter. It doesn't okay. matter that, that, that EVs are coming. We know that they're coming. What matters is Ford is trying to sell something as a Mustang when it's not a Mustang. It's the classic so it's the classic bait and switch. I think I know the answer to this, but let me ask it anyway. What if Ford had come out with any other vehicle type uh, to put the Mustang name on? What if they had come out with a Mustang Ford or a Mustang sedan um, or I mean, that's the only one I can really think of. But but what what if it were a Mustang sedan? Rear wheel drive Mustang sedan V8 powered. You would still see, I think, just as much backlash. Maybe not quite as much backlash because a sedan, I think, is still you still have that concept of, well, it can still be kind of a performance vehicle. A lot of people don't get that you can have an SUV or a crossover still be. A I mean, the Dodge Charger vehicle. got away with it. I mean, the Dodge Charger, you know, name was put on yeah, the four door the, the modern there, era. And, and, and there was, there was some pushback. Um, I remember when that car first came out, but the difference is there, the Charger was gone. The Charger disappeared for what, what something like two decades when it was finally revived has this four door sedan. And I remember some, you know, charge people still being upset by it. Not to, not to bash on, on Dodge or the Mopar fans, because I mean, the classic charger, the new, the new chargers, they're amazing, but they haven't had that same consecutive 55 years of Mustang, 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 Mustang. That really just has people that really have people in a, in a fervor over this right now. Let me, uh, you know, you bring up the, the 50, 55 years, uh, it's not like this is replacing the Mustang. The right. Mustang continues. All the great right. Mustangs we know and more. I mean, Ford has really opened up the Mustang lineup with, you know, GT, GT350, GT500, EcoBoost. I mean, I mean, it's it's a healthier lineup than it's ever been. And it's not like all of that ends and, and the Mach-E is the future of the Mustang. It, the Mach-E is just alongside the Mustang. Well, I think, I think what has some people concerned is... Is this the future of Mustang? Will Ford use this as a reason to say, okay, well, in the next four or five years, uh, you know, the the regular Mustang is going to be gone. This is going to be it. I think that's where some of the pushback comes from. Um, I don't think there's any evidence for that sort of fear. There, there is no, there's no direct evidence. But when you look at Mustang sales, Mustang sales are they're, they're falling. I mean, Ford, so Ford I wanna... has done a good job kind of spinning that as saying it's it's the best-selling sports car in the world. But when you look at, at the sales numbers, 
Mustang sales are really dropping. They are, they are actually down more than half in the last four years. And um, not uh, in 2019, it is still the best selling among the, the Dodge Challenger and the Camaro. However, the Dodge Challenger in the last few months has actually been selling more than the Mustang. And again, hats off to uh, the Dodge family for um, wringing water from a stone and getting sales out of that ancient, ancient car that we all still love. Uh, while while Ford and Chevy are making amazing sports cars out of the Camaro and and the Mustang, uh, but but yeah, I mean the sales are definitely falling, and and one of my arguments is that um, this helps secure the future of the Mustang and probably the future of the gas powered two by two Mustang sports car. It's not going to replace it; it's going to pay for it. Okay, can you can you explain that position a little bit more on exactly how that's going to happen? Because Ford would need to sell a lot of these, frankly, well, to make Ford, that happen. Ford has already said it plans to sell 50,000 in the first year. And that's actually a larger number than I expected. If they had said anything 25,000 and under, I would have said they're not really serious about this electric car, they're more doing it for the perception of it, the image, and, and kind of, they have to because of the the requirements and carb states and things like that. Uh, but the fact that they said 50,000 in the first year, that's a big number. And it's only held to 50,000 because of the availability of batteries, which is, you know, something that every automaker making EVs is going to run up against in the coming years. Um, I, so it, that gives me the impression that is evidence to me that they expect to sell many more than those, many more than 50,000 per year after this gets up and running. Yeah, but... You know what? I mean, we can talk about expectations, but and for the record, I think Ford is I, I don't think Ford will sell that many. Uh, I mean, Ford is also expecting to sell a lot of Ford Explorers, but Explorers are down, I think, like th almost 50 percent uh, the last quarter. And uh, and year over year, I think Ford Explorer sales are down 40 percent. I mean, I'm I'm sure. Nobody forecast that that was going to happen. Sure, we don't know. So, if, we don't know if the forecast is right, but Ford has said that they will make money. Uh, that the Machi is profitable already. It'll be profitable from day one. So it's not like you know they have to get an economy as a scale up and running and sell so many to start making money. It's going to make money from day one. Um, so everyone they sell, I think, is goes back into the coffers to help the Mustang. And I again, I just. I just, you, you, when you talk about a vehicle with 55 years of history being what it is, I, I think that right there is evidence enough that they're they're never going to stop making Mustangs as two plus two coupes that oh. are that are gas powered. Oh, I'm I'm sure they can. I have faith in Ford to make some terrible decisions. <laughs> and, and and honestly, John, when you look at it from just a, a strictly perspective of numbers, bean counters, Mustang sales, the way they're declining. There's, I mean, there's quickly becoming a reasonable argument to say, oh, maybe we should try to wrap this up here in a little bit if we can't get sales to turn around. Here's, I mean, here's another question then: if if Mustang enthusiasts are worrying about this replacing the Mustang, what is a better what is a better option? Um, the Mustang dying and having no Mustang, or the Mustang Coupe dying, having the Mustang Mach E for now, and then bringing the the Mustang Coupe back at another time? Mustang dying. Oh, wow. And, and bringing it back. Well, well, let's be honest, John, like I like I just said, this isn't a Mustang. It's not a two door, two plus two pony car. It's not. It's just it's not. It, it's me, like, me, OK, if you go say you go to Star Wars, say you go to see Star Wars here yeah. next month in December, which is owned by Disney. Right. Disney. Disney right. has all the all the purse strings. You sit down to watch Star Wars at a Marvel movie starts. Do, do you want to go see a Marvel movie? No, you are going to see Star Wars. Do people want to buy a Mustang that's, yeah, a, I, that, that's a four door freaking crossover. It's not a Mustang. But I watch Star Wars. I watch Star Wars movies. I watch Star Wars as cartoons. I read Star Wars as books at comic books. Like there's many forms of Star Wars. There are many forms of Star Wars, but the whole point is trying to sell something when that's not what it is. It's let me let me go it's, back to it's something the, you it's, said. it's 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 the bait and switch. And and I understand what Ford is doing. They're they're trying to bank on the uh, on the marketing power of Mustang. But there's two problems there. One, it's going to raise 
people's expectations that aren't really in the Mustang field. Okay, well, this is going to be like a Mustang. And I'm sorry, it's not. It's, I mean, the Ford Focus RS is a great performance vehicle. Does that mean it could technically be called the Mustang because it just has great performance? Well, we can't, no, it's, 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 it's a different formula entirely. It, it is a different formula, but A, we haven't driven it. And B, uh, I feel like I can say from the experience of having driven and now owning an electric car that when, when you want to make an electric car a fast car, electric cars are a great foundation for that. Oh, so yeah. I feel like this will probably drive extremely well in terms of being a performance vehicle um, because a, an electric platform is great for that. Uh, let me, I want to go back to a point though, that, okay. uh, that I've been trying to get in. So, all right. So to be a Mustang, you've, you've mentioned a few things like two plus two coupe, um, rear wheel drive, but you said it would be okay for it to switch to electric. Why isn't a gas engine part of what makes a Mustang a Mustang? You could say a gas engine is certainly, but when you look at Mustang's history, I, I'm not thinking in terms of the, the the fundamental function of the engine. You know, whether it's burning gasoline or running on electricity, the power is the power, right? And Mustang has had different engines over the course of its lifetime. Four cylinders, Four cylinders six, six cylinders. cylinders, eight cylinders. So in my mind, for my definition, that's not part of the fundamental Formula. So a, be because so a, a diesel Mustang would be fine. A a hydrogen fuel cell Mustang would be fine. I so don't know don't... how well they would sell, but when you break it down to this basic formula, and, and and let me give you a little bit of background too, because I have a lot of Mustang friends. I'm 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 in some Mustang groups, some Mustang clubs, and long before the Mach E ever came out. And apologies to my Mustang friends. I, I fear I might upset a few of you right now. There are so many ridiculous, stupid opinions on what makes a real Mustang. It's absurd. You can talk to people that say, oh, Ford hasn't made a real Mustang since 1969. You know, and, and it's just and it's ridiculous. Or Ford, you know, the Ford Fox body was never a real Mustang. Or you could talk to somebody. Oh, I'll never have a four cylinder in my Mustang. That's not a real Mustang. So. With that in mind, I set about trying to figure out, okay, in its most basic elemental form, how can you describe a quote-unquote real Mustang? That's where I come up with this formula of the two-door, two-plus-two pony car. And other people I've seen are, are mentioning that as well. Jimmy Dinsmore, I think, actually mentioned that uh, you know, with, with his petition, that that's really the basic formula. And that's why I say the electric power doesn't matter. I mean, it's... Realistically, it's going to matter to some people, but it's it's small potatoes in terms of the larger issue here. Do you follow mm. what I'm saying? I do. I do. And you're right. I think they're, you know, not all Mustang enthusiasts are the same. There's a spectrum and there's going to be people that you're never going to convince, um, you know, even a four cylinder Mustang is a Mustang where there are other peoples who are, you know, broad enough that they will consider the Mach-E a Mustang. Um, you know, one one thing I perceive going on is that, you know, of the Mustang enthusiasts who are voicing their opinion and that are upset about the Mach-E name being, or the, the Mustang name being applied to the Mach-E, I don't know how large in number that group is, but with the sales of the car falling, it, it, it appears to me that this is one of those situations where um, it's a, it's, a, it's the same old story of a bunch of passionate people telling an automaker what they should do, but then that group is not putting their money where their mouths are. Because if the Mustang were, were so important to so many people, the sales would be up and, and no one would have to be worrying about the Mustang going away. Uh, but that's not the case. So it's like, well, if, if you want the Mustang to be as secure as possible, um, and you don't want this to be seen as the future Mustang or something to replace the Mustang. Where are all you people who love the Mustang when it comes to buying them? Well, that, that's a very easy question to answer. We're trying to make enough money to afford one. I mean, <laughs> that is a good point. I, I, I mean, I mean, you can get a, a base model EcoBoost Mustang for, I, I think, mid to upper 20s. And, and that's not a, a bad price point, really. 
Um, but it's still it's, I, it, for... it, it's still a lot of money for a lot of people that would like to have a Mustang. And I'm talking about a lot of the younger generation. You're seeing, I, I, I guess I should say, I don't know this for sure, but at the various events that I go to, the, the Mustang meetings, the, uh, the Mustang uh, gatherings, the majority of owners of like, you know, the GTs and especially the GT350, GT500, they're they're in that 50 plus demographic where, you know, they have a little bit more money. Once upon a time, the Mustang was, you know, the more affordable bang for buck. Just about anybody can get one. And that's not a, that's not, a, you know, a, a, a black flag against Ford. That's just the, that's the the society that changing, we live yeah, in now the changing it's, it's, it's the changing it's the changing times vehicles are just more expensive so that's part of the reason right there it's it's just not within reach of a lot of people who would like to buy one and and what's happening then instead of buying a new mustang they might buy one that's four or five years old that you can get uh you know f for a fair amount less right well i but you could make the argument that some people who could become mustang buyers don't buy them because they're impractical, they are essentially two-door coupes, or because they're not very high-tech, or because um, they are environmentally conscious, all of which the Mach-E addresses. It's more practical, it's, it's environmentally conscious because it's a pure electric, and it's super high-tech, which a lot of young people appreciate. So can't you see this as more of an entry vehicle into the Mustang lifestyle um, that, that may get others to buy a Mustang as a second car because they like the Mach-E so much? John, absolutely. You're absolutely right. But there's one big problem. It's not entry into the Mustang lifestyle. It's not a Mustang. So you don't, it's, you don't it's, picture... it's not this, this could be, this could be the Ford Mach E has is, and people could say, well, Hey, you know, if this is what I'm, if this is, you know, a little bit more environmentally conscious, I can step into this. I can step into this and enjoy this. And Hey, this is kind of fun performance. It's Mustang inspired. Now I'd kind of like to see what, you know, what a Mustang is like. Right. So you don't, you don't picture anyone driving a Mach E like welcome at a Mustang meet. I'll be honest, I'll, 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 I'll be honest, be honest, not really, not really. Yeah. And, and I mean, and now this has only been out a week, right? I mean, right. there's, we're making a lot of judgments here just by the seat of our pants, but we haven't driven the car yet. It looks like it would be pretty fun to drive. It's just the point that I have to keep coming back to by fundamental design. It's not a Mustang. See, I, and I, I, I get your argument that there's like one true form of a Mustang and, a, and you can't put that name on anything else. Uh, I, I think that's an argument that a lot of enthusiasts are making. But I also think that it's not just that the form of the Mach-E is not a 2 plus 2 coupe. It's that it's a crossover. It's that I, I think it would be easier to swallow if it were a sedan or something else. I, I think it'd I think be a little the, easier, yeah. I think the word crossover has a stereotype to it and carries connotations of like what parents drive to avoid minivans, but they're also kind of poser vehicles because they're not real SUVs. And I think Ford made a little mistake here, even mentioning the word crossover, because let, let's look at the crossover segment. The, the interesting thing about the crossover segment is that it doesn't have very defined edges of, of what gets included. It's not like a truck where it's obvious what's a truck and it's obvious what's uh, a sedan with a crossover. There's so many different kinds and types that can go anywhere from things that look just like normal five door hatchbacks to things that do look like rough and tumble SUVs. What I think the Mach E is, is something more akin to an Audi Q8 or a Mercedes GLE Coupe or a BMW X4, where it's kind of like a four door coupe crossover where it's got a really kind of fast back roof line. It's, it's tall, but I wouldn't, I, even though it's tall, I wouldn't say it's raised. Uh, it's not like an SUV with a huge ground clearance. It's more just tall to afford a higher and more comfortable seating position than it is, you know, tall to get over a tree trunk or a, or a, a rock in the middle of the road. Right. I, I mean, I mean, that's obvious. I mean, it's, it's, it's a crossover crossovers I, by definition don't necessarily fit in one category or another, hence crossover. And you're right. Ford would have, this would have been easier to swallow. I think if it had been a sedan, I don't think it would have been much easier to swallow because it's still upsetting that basic formula. And, and 
you know, a point that I'll that I'll bring up here because I've been trying to suss this out as well. You know, what is Ford's true intention here? I mean, we know obviously they're trying to brand this as a Mustang because they want to sell people on that Mustang lifestyle. And I know you've said, hey, that's that's a pretty good compliment to Mustang that Ford is coming out with this awesome electric crossover with with statistics and performance that that's that's really top of the range. I don't see it that way, though. I see this as Ford, frankly, being scared. They're not sure how this is going to go. They're not sure how this is going to sell. They aren't prepared to try to sell this new electric performance crossover on its own merits. So they're going to try to tie Mustang into it, selling not the vehicle, but the lifestyle. And now people, there's the, in theory, people are going to come into this with preconceived notions that, okay, this thing is, hey, this thing is going to be like a Mustang. The Mustang people aren't going to come into that because they know it's not a Mustang. But the really, the buyers at Ford the, is targeting with this, not Mustang people, but people that want that Mustang lifestyle and might be interested. They're going to go into this with preconceived notions. Okay, here's what this is going to be like. Maybe it impresses them. Maybe it doesn't. But either way, Mustang does not help this vehicle sell. Calling this a Mustang does not help this vehicle sell. I disagree completely. Let me let me make two arguments why. Um, for one, I, I think you characterized what I've said about why Ford did it um, um, sort of right, but you didn't kind of flesh out the details. I think what Ford has done with the mach -E is unlike other automakers who I think their egos would not let them admit that Tesla was doing a better job than them making an electric vehicle. So they, they did their own way, like Audi, Mercedes, and, and Jaguar. I think Ford put its ego aside and said, you know, recognize that Tesla is 70% of the EV market in the US and that they are doing something right. So Ford got busy analyzing what Tesla did. And, and I think one thing they noticed was that people aren't necessarily or just buying Teslas because they're technically superior EVs, they are getting excited about Teslas and passionate about Teslas like people used to get about the iPhone. Like there there was a, an emotional connection being made that was, was far beyond just the technical um, capability of the, of the vehicle. And it was being driven on this kind of wave of excitement over the vehicles. And I think in one sense, I, you characterize it as Ford was scared they couldn't sell it without attaching the Mustang to it to give it something more. I don't think that Ford was scared. I think Ford saw that it wasn't enough to just make a good EV on paper, that they, it had to have an, it had to be able to make an emotional connection with people and get people excited. And the only intellectual property they have in their portfolio that can do that, or maybe not the only, but the one that can do it best is Mustang. If they make it a Mustang, people are going to have an emotional reaction to it. My second point is they were fully aware that reaction could be both negative and positive. And they don't care. Because another thing they learned from Tesla is that it doesn't matter if people are are um, calling you stupid or calling you great, they're talking about you. And that's way better than them not talking about you, which is exactly what's happened to every other EV that's launched in the Tesla era. It, they've been completely forgotten about. Okay, first of all, ask Volkswagen how many diesel vehicles they sold because people were talking about Dieselgate. There is such a thing as negative talk. You don't want that. I understand the whole idea of, hey, any talk is good talk. No, not necessarily. All right. Let, wait, not, wait, wait, wait. Not, I, I, not, that is not, not necessarily. Fair, that is not a fair comparison because, and I want to bring up this point too, and this is, this is actually my closing point, which is that you, you brought up Volkswagen. They, they broke the law. Like, okay, yes. <laughs> it, yes. If, if, if talk about breaking the law, that is bad no matter what. But the bad talk about the Mustang, they, they're, nothing bad happens because it's called the Mustang. Nothing. No one is no. hurt. No one gets their livelihood taken away. No, nothing bad happens except, and, and I think Ford has faith that over time that this is going to be good for Mustang and good for the, the actual sports car Mustang and not bad. 
So I, I think ultimately, whether people are talking about hating the name or loving it, they're, they're talking about the vehicle, and that gives Ford way more penetration and, into the mind share of EV, potential EV shoppers than it would have otherwise. Mm. We're still talking about it, and we probably will be for weeks, if not months on end. But if Ford had just knocked it out of the park with a vehicle that you can't not talk about, you don't need to put Mustang on it. But that's why you can't, you can't do that. Tesla. But sure you can. You, no, you, you can't. You, 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 you just, you hunker down and you do the math and you come out with a good vehicle. And honestly, I think this Mach E is that vehicle. I don't think Ford needed to put the Mustang on it to try to engage people's passion. I think the only thing they're doing there, I think the only thing they're doing, and I've seen this before at Ford, with a, with various models and and various rollouts where it's like we're going to try to build a vehicle we could possibly build it better but instead of really trying to go that extra distance we're going to try to wrap it up in some interesting branding and we're going to try to give it uh, you know you know pull on people's think that's heartstrings what's happened here at all. yeah yeah i i i think i think it is i, think I really I, do you you can't you right no automaker can blow tesla out of the water in terms of specs the, the, it's not like ford has the technology in its back pocket to make a 400 mile range ev they just can't do it they they what they've managed to do is make a vehicle that has come the closest tesla any other vehicle has and has has matched tesla on many fronts uh, but it it surpasses Tesla on few, if any, and actually falls behind on a few others. The only EV I would say that's come out that has exceeded Tesla on a few fronts is the Porsche Taycan. And that's only on a few fronts, uh, charging speed and handling. Um, you, you could argue that every automaker exceeds Tesla on maybe like fit and finish or, or you know, you know, quality of craftsmanship. That That's one thing I'll give you. But but I, the thing is, that I think Ford knew, like, look, we, we have made probably the, the, the best EV to challenge Tesla, but we haven't blown Tesla out of the water. And we also know that Tesla has this extra special ingredient of the passion and, and loyalty that it stirs in people. And we need to somehow add that as well. And I, I just think they, they didn't want to trust it to just the, the blue oval badge on the front or, or any other brand IP that they had in the portfolio. They thought that they could make an emotional reaction by using Mustang. And, and I, I, I think it's going to blow over eventually, especially when the cars start getting in people's hands and people start driving them. Um, like, two, I, I think, like two years from now. A year from now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, eventually you're going to find a diehard Ford person who's complaining now who ends up buying a Mach-E to use as their daily driver with a bunch of other regular Mustangs in the garage for the weekend. And that's going to that's going to be shown to be like the, the, the most awesome setup. And and I think it'll actually start being bought by those 50 and older Mustang people. Um, I, I, I'm just I'm not seeing it happen. I'm not seeing it happen. And, you know, it's it's interesting that you pointed out that uh, Ford used its most storied nameplate, its most storied moniker that it has in its inventory to make a vehicle that kind of competes with Tesla. Uh, that that I think that kind of that sells it right there. Ford couldn't make something that they felt was a full on knock it out of the park. Hey, this thing is awesome and it's going to dominate its segment. They knew, okay, we're going to have to try to wrap this up and sell a lifestyle because we're not quite there yet. It shows me that they don't have confidence in this vehicle. I don't, it also saying... shows me, hold on, it also shows me that they're willing to throw their history under the bus to try to sell this vehicle. And, you keep saying and, and selling I, a lifestyle, but I don't think that's what they're doing. I think they're selling I'm, a brand and an image. John, look at, look at the press photos that Ford put out. There was like, I think maybe one that really just showed the vehicle up close. The rest was like people hanging out with the Mustang at the corner with the Mustang in like 30% of the photo. I mean, ha having been on the PR and the media side, and, and I even had a little bit of affiliation with Ford way back in the day, this screams to me that they're trying to sell lifestyle. And they're wrapping that up with the Mustang moniker that people are yes they're certainly very passionate about and you want to inspire that passion for your support you don't want to take that passion and turn it against you and i get that ford is thinking well we'll get people talking about this car yes it's certainly going to be controversial but you know we'll convince them ford 
if you're listening, and I hope you are, you've got basically a year to really convince us that this is, in fact, something worthy of the name, because it certainly doesn't fit the formula that you built for 55 years, and it doesn't blow out the competition in terms of specs and performance, so... Well, what you, what, so what you going to do, you know, I, I think you're twisting my words on that a little. I, I think Ford deserves an incredible amount of credit for for challenging Tesla as well as it is, because uh, other EV manufacturers like the Germans have, I think, failed pretty spectacularly in their first attempts at EVs. Ford has eclipsed all of those in in, in a single bound and can stand toe to toe with what Tesla is going to bring out with the Model Y. I, I think that's a huge accomplishment. I don't see that as them like realizing that they were bringing out an inferior product. It can it can be it can be an accomplishment. I I'm like like I said, I'm not debating that this could be a very good car. It's just it's it's disturbing that Ford is willing to toss it's Mustang history under the bus to try to make that happen. They didn't, they didn't need to do that. And it's painting a very bad picture in the eyes of enthusiasts. And I think that's going to come back and, and, and kick him in the butt. Well, and, and going back to, like I said, I think the, the argument I will end my um, case with is that you've got these enthusiasts They're They're angry. Um, At the end of the day, like I said, it, 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 there, it seems like a, an, an overreaction to something that, doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't physically affect anybody, doesn't take away anyone's livelihood. It's just expanding a brand. Like, how does that? How does that hurt any Mustang enthusiast to the to the to 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 the degree that they're giving this this react this hostile reaction? Obviously, it it doesn't hurt anybody. And I mean, it, you're I think you're going a little bit too far saying that there's this really hostile reaction. I mean, people are upset that something that they've been passionate about for 55 years has evolved into something that frankly it shouldn't be it 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 shouldn't it shouldn't be called a mustang because it doesn't have that basic formula i mean no nobody's going to be hurt by it but who ford who wrote- ford might be hurt by it when they realize that okay maybe people aren't really buying into this as a mustang and it could affect and it could affect the sales of the crossover as well as mustang sales which by but, the way if ford wants to sell more mustangs the 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 minor facelift wasn't very well received so i mean they, they've got to have a facelift in in the works here and just just need to make the mustang a little bit more appealing a little bit more better maybe a little bit more affordable to the people that want to buy it but who wrote the rule that the Mustang format can't change? <laughs> there is no hard and fast rule that it can't change. But I, I mean, what's to say? I, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got a guitar hanging on my wall in the office here, right? Who says that a drum kit can't be called a guitar? Who wrote the rule that says you can't have drums oh this this isn't my drum kit this is a guitar no it's not it's it's drums it's it's not his it's not but it's specific but, uh, his that's, rules that's a that's a i don't think that's a, it's, it's, a it's correct a, analogy because it's a concept it, it's a concept it's you something think a that's, mustang is is a concept like and not a brand name it's a brand name it, it's, it's also not a concept. It, it's it's also this formula of two plus two two door low slung rear wheel drive pony car it's a it's a brand that, name. That, it's not a guitar. It, it's like, like a, a guitar. Nobody owns the word guitar, but somebody owns the word Mustang because it's a trademark brand name. No, okay, but is there a hard and fast rule that says I can't call my drum kit a guitar? I, I mean, uh, you're 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 going I think a little bit too no, deep but, here. No, but but the 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 guitar manufacturer Gibson can go make a drum set if it wants. Yeah, and they'll call it a drum set. They won't call it a Les Paul, right, right? Because that's not their brand name. But if they have, if if their brand name is uh, Gibson, and they want to say we, this is the Gibson uh, drum set, they can do that. Sure. I mean, you can change up any formula that you want, but when it's existed in a certain way for over half a century, and it's what millions and millions of people are familiar with and comfortable with and enjoy, and then you just decide to change it. Obviously, there's going to be some some backlash, I, and, I, and it's, the, especially if there isn't really any need to change. I mean, I think that's the bigger question. Does this car need to be called Mustang? No. 
They're, they're trying you say to. There's no need, but I say there's no there's no harmful effect. Period. If well, I, I certainly would, there is a harmful effect. There's a petition with thousands of signatures of of I'm upset saying, people that I'm saying those upset people they will feel no harmful effect from from this vehicle. But um, Ford could feel a harmful effect from them deciding to go to Chevrolet, say, to buy a new C8 Corvette. Right. I'm, which, I'm, I'm arguing they're just wrong, and that they shouldn't feel that way. Well, because because they're not people are being, entitled to their feelings. Oh, right? of course, and people I'm are entitled, entitled to, to say they shouldn't feel that way. Yeah, because I think this is a good thing. Um, uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this has been fun. Uh, all right, that, we, that's hey, that's uh, that's pretty much my closing argument. I'll, I'll I mean, I obviously, I, we we agree it's, to disagree. But, I'll, but I'll, I, it's interesting though because we've never really touched on this in our conversations during the week. But I think you and I have a fundamental. Uh, difference in how we view what the Mustang is. I mean, you you literally described it as like um, a, a, a concept. It is a it is a thing that is inviolable. Like like a like a guitar is always a guitar. And I looked at it as a brand that can be whatever the brand owner wants or needs it to be, and can that, be that's applied an, that's to different ways. That's an astute observation. That's certainly uh, an astute yeah, observation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no, no judgment on either one. It's actually a testament to Ford that you know it, it it's that that the brand is so strong that a that a subset of people view it as so sacred, and that's what I think it really is. And um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's a very good observation, John. I'll I'll give you credit on that one. I'll uh, and I'll I'll follow that up by saying. Um, when Chevrolet announced that it was going to redo the Corvette has a mid engine. That's, I mean, that, that's, that's sort of a fundamental formula. It's, change akin, there too. it's akin to this. Yeah. Be, because the Corvette was always, you know, kind of this, this grand touring front engine, long, big hood, rear wheel yep. drive, two seater. It's still the rear wheel drive, two seater, but now the engine is in back. And when I was talking to Corvette people, I mean, there were, there were a few people that were upset. They weren't as upset as the Mustang people are now, but I attribute that to this something is... very important. GM blew the world out of the water with the C8, offering that kind of performance at that price. There was no way you could not love that car. Ford, if you're going to reboot an icon like the Mustang, well, that's well, that's how you do it. Ford could make a four-door Mustang crossover, but they <laughs> got to blow it out of the water, and this doesn't blow it out of the water. I, I, I think it's a great analogy to bring up, but I think there are some key differences. Uh, for one, the C8 Corvette is actually replacing the C7 Corvette. So yeah. th there there is no uh, front engine rear wheel drive Corvette anymore. Yeah, which, which, makes it, which makes it even all the more impressive that this car is, uh, I mean, it's winning awards. People love the freaking car. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, I think another really big difference is that aside from the fact that they did blow it out of the water, I think it's much easier for a group of enthusiasts to accept a mid-engine supercar than it is to accept something with the crossover word attached. And I go back to my previous argument about just that word crossover has a negative connotation. And if you had given this like a different name, I, I like it, it probably still wouldn't have been totally accepted, but it would have gone down easier if it didn't have the word crossover attached. Um, uh, so, all right, we're, we're, I think we're, we're starting to go around in circles and there's still a few other things I want to talk about. Um, now tonight, uh, as we're recording this podcast, uh, tonight, Tesla, uh, speaking of electric vehicles is going to have a major event and finally debut the Tesla pickup truck. Um, and Tesla isn't like other automakers. We don't have embargoed information about what this will be that we can tell you. We don't have any idea what it looks like. And from Elon Musk's tweets, we just know that it's going to look wild. It is not going to look like like our conception of a truck. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that because it's happening tonight. So Chris, I wanted to kind of throw it to you, get your impression of what's um, coming from Tesla or maybe just the hysteria over the, the truck since we know so little about it. Well, I, first of all, I think it's great. I've always been a proponent of EV power, instant uh, instant power, instant torque. Who wouldn't want that in a truck, especially when you've got the diesel guys that are bragging about a thousand foot pounds of torque? You know, the 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 rub is going to be that it doesn't roll coal, and I hate to say that, but uh, there, there's <laughs> there's there's kind of that. I mean, there's that truck lifestyle. 
Um, and I, you talk about messing, messing with somebody's like, uh, you know, (laughs) formula sacred. Yeah. Sacred formula. I mean, a Mustang is one thing, but, but messing with the American truck. I mean, there, there is no more popular vehicle in uh, the world than the American truck. So many are sold. The most popular vehicle of all time to this day is the Ford F series. Um, so I, it's, it's incredibly bold to me for Tesla to be like, uh, we can enter this space too. Let, let's look at other. Let, let's take take a second and look at other people who have entered this space. How about the Toyota Tundra? How about the Nissan Titan? That their sales barely make a dent in what the domestic uh, uh, automakers sell in terms of trucks. And now we have Tesla coming in, and you uh, and with whatever it's going to be, it's going to be crazy looking. Uh, it'll probably have tons of weird innovations and things like that built into it, not only because it's an electric vehicle and that affords some different cool things to do, but because it's a Tesla and they'll take a chance to do anything different or weird if they can. Uh, I just, it's it's the one of the ballsiest things I've, I've seen. But the, the weird thing is, as ballsy as it is, uh, there are so many electric pickups on deck to come out in the next like two to three years. You know, we've got Ford, is coming out with an electric F-150. Uh, you have Rivian, which is um, a standalone electric automaker like Tesla, but unlike Tesla, they have investments from some major companies like Amazon and and Ford, as a matter of fact. Um, you have Bollinger, which is making kind of a really weird boxy pickup truck. Well, I, and we just, I think, learned today that GM is supposed to have an electric truck out next year. Right. So I what what boggles my mind is what do all these automakers know that we don't know that like electric pickup pickups are going to be the next big thing. I don't I don't see what they're seeing that a bunch of people are going to flock to electric pickups. I think what they're seeing is the future and the writing on the wall and they're preparing themselves now. I don't think any one of these automakers are prepared to sell a half a million pickup trucks, you know, a half a million electric pickup trucks in the next couple of years, but they're setting themselves up for when gasoline eventually in the United States gets back to four or five dollars a gallon. Now people can have their big truck with the big power and not have to spend that much money trying to fill it up with diesel. My my best guess is that they look at pickup sales today and they see that Ford and GM and Dodge are actually making tons of money selling luxury pickups, selling like sixty, seventy thousand dollar versions of the F one fifty and the Ram and the Silverado. Um, and when you can sell a truck for that much, I think it makes it easier to sell it as an EV because that, um, that price can more absorb the higher cost of the EV powertrain and the batteries. And also I think the capabilities of an electric truck are going to be even more impressive than the capabilities we've seen of electric sedans and crossovers. I think what we're going to see is even larger batteries and we're going to see the first 400 mile range electric vehicle. I think that's going to be a truck. I think in terms of towing, it's going to be insane what these can do. I know, I know Ford used an F-150, uh, to tow a train, but you know, that was kind of debunked as actually pretty easy to do. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think tex- Tesla is literally going to like tow a building or pull uh, you know, a giant, uh, uh, redwood out of the ground or something. Maybe pull a train that's not sitting on a track. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I would exactly. like to see that. I would like or to see that. Or up a hill Tesla. or something. You and, know, I, and and you know the I mean the the Tesla truck. Obviously, we don't know about it yet. Um, we'll know all about it after this podcast comes out. But um, I think four to five hundred miles is coming tonight. You know, you know, as yeah. we record this podcast, I think that's I coming agree. tonight. And the and a truck already. I mean, with with electric cars, the idea is to try to get them as lightweight as possible. Batteries are heavy. Weight isn't quite as much of a concern in trucks. No. So there's the platform is already there to support more weight. People aren't as concerned about a truck weighing five or six or gosh, maybe even seven thousand pounds. As long as you have the power to move all of that. And, and when there, you have there a big is a battery little, with electric power. Yeah, there is a little offset, too, because you take out the large, heavy gas or diesel engine and you're replacing it with smaller, lighter electric motors. So mm-hmm. while you're adding weight with batteries, you're taking out weight, I yeah. think, with the swap of the motors. Uh, that That isn't to say that the electric trucks we're going to see coming aren't going to be heavier than than uh, their gas powered mm-hmm. counterparts, I think they will be. But you're right; they're they're ultimately going to be more powerful, even if they are heavier. Yeah, and and I think 
you know, going back to what we were talking about, about, you know, what, what are these manufacturers seeing that we don't, I think for once they're actually seeing the future and not like, you know, the next six months or the next year, but I, I think they're seeing longer term and they're saying, Hey, we need to establish a foothold here now because the truck segment is the most popular segment in the United States, hands down. No questions whatsoever. If we can establish a foothold now, when this technology improves and range becomes a non-issue and you can charge up in a matter of minutes, whether that's five years down the road or 10 years down the road, we are already going to be established and ready to sell a million electric trucks. But the question is, just like a Mustang enthusiast, can you convince a good old American boy uh, who, you know, whether they drive a truck to work or use a truck on a farm, or just drive a truck because they want to be a truck person. Can you convince that person to buy an electric truck? I just don't know the answer to that. You know, I think it's, there'll be some that will never go. There will be some that you won't pry their diesel from their cold dead hands. Um, that said, I think there's going to be a larger segment of, of the truck market, of truck buyers, that will be open to electric because... They like having the truck experience, but I mean, they're also getting legitimate use out of it. And there is there is no argument. There is not one single tiny argument that can stand up to the instant electric torque you get in an EV. There is just there isn't a diesel around that will ever match it. And when you talk about towing, when you talk about off roading, having that kind of power is just epic so it, it's a case of as people get more used to it they're going to get more comfortable with it there's going to be a segment that will never change but i don't think it's as polarizing as mustang just because you know if you break it down to that basic formula formula once again it's not necessarily about what kind of engine is under the hood it's about the power well, that it makes well we'll we'll see if Tesla goes so far to break whatever mold <laughs> there is for trucks because they're so wild they might just just go a little bit too far. I also think that one uh, segment we're not thinking about is the commercial segment, commercial vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think uh, electric trucks and probably electric vans too. I mean, we're already seeing it in Europe where um, a lot of fleets of commercial vehicles are turning over to electric because um, not only do you have um, lower fuel cost. You're not buying fuel, you're buying electricity and that, that costs a lot less. So, uh, much lower, lower costs there, but also maintenance costs. These yeah. things have so many fewer parts. They're so much more durable. They, they go for so much longer. So if you're a fleet operator, you know, whether you've got a dozen vehicles or you've got hundreds, um, electric vehicles make more sense for you, uh, now than I think they do for just regular consumers who are buying one. I'm so, so. glad you said that because that so often gets overlooked when you talk about electric vehicles, the simplicity, there are so many fewer moving parts. The maintenance costs are so much lower and I come from a family of truck drivers and I, I can understand very clearly the benefits of having that kind of of torque once again when when uh when uh elon brought out the their tesla semi and he was he was talking about the performance in zero to 60 i remember um on social media especially seeing you know just some people complaining ah you'll never take my diesel and ah, i don't care if it goes from zero to 60 in six seconds and it's like well that's not the point do you really want to go 15 miles an hour <laughs> up a mountain you know you know right up, up you know up going over uh what going over interstate 80 uh, yeah. You know, in the Rocky Mountains, do you really want to go 15 miles an hour? Or would you like to have something that can tug along that big heavy load at 30 or 40 miles per hour when you're not pulling a trailer? Do you still want to shift nine gears to get up to 40 miles an hour in, in 20 seconds? Or would you like to roll on the gas and, you know, be up to highway speed with with all the other traffic? You know, it's it, it's kind of the mindset. People aren't necessarily realizing just how many benefits there are, but there are tremendous benefits. Tremendous for sure. benefits. For sure. All right. Well, I want to I wanna take a quick break. Um, we've been talking for a while. Yes. But um, if you want to hear more, um, you can, of course, read what we're writing about the Tesla truck and, of course, the Ford Mustang Mach-E on MotorOne.com. And you can follow the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, where you can find us at MotorOne.com. Uh, coming up, we're going to do something a little bit different. Rather than talk about what we drove this week, we are going to talk about our favorite vehicles at the LA Auto Show, uh, which is going on this week as well. So come back in a minute. All 
All right, we're back. So I want to talk a little bit about the LA Auto Show before we end the episode. It's going on right now. Um, it, I think it's a, it's been a better auto show than past years because uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Detroit Auto Show, which is usually the biggest um, U.S. auto show of the year and was normally held in January, got moved to June. So we're not going to have a Detroit Auto Show in January this year. And I think that meant automakers used the L.A. Auto Show uh, for some debuts that would have been held over for Detroit. So we got a pretty good show. Um, I don't want to go over every vehicle, but how about we pick two that we really liked from the show and and talk about them. So let me start with you, Chris. What were what were the two vehicles you liked most? Yeah, I mean, ironically enough, since we're talking about electric vehicles, the uh, the Karma SC2 concept, I, oh, you know, gorgeous. It's it's just unbelievably gorgeous and stunning and. Part of me is very angry that they call it SC2 because I just keep thinking of Saturn. The Saturn, yeah. <laughs> you know, which, you know, you know, hey, yeah, C2 wasn't bad, but well. <laughs> this thing is just, I, I mean, this thing is just, it's pretty from every angle. Those big butterfly doors, I'm not sure I've ever seen butterfly doors quite as large as those. Uh, you know, I don't know what they'd be like to open and close, but it's just, it's this gorgeous two-seater grand touring just classic shape um and it, it's a concept so it's not going to go into production uh karma says that uh her, remember correctly dual motors 1100 horsepower yeah, they, crazy they, specs. They, they, they say it would do zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds it's all theoretical it's just that those are estimates that they got from their uh, just from their engineering and their simulations but that car is going to that serves as the architecture for future karma vehicles going forward. And, you know, we haven't heard much about karma. If they can do more stuff like this, I would really like to hear more because that thing is gorgeous. What I really like about it. And, and this is the SC two. There was an SC one concept as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe another car that debuted in China a while back. But to date, the only thing that karma is selling is the Rivero, which is basically the old Fisker karma. And so I really like these concepts they're coming out with because since the only thing they're selling is a car that's been around for a long time now, uh, and they've spruced it up a little, but they really haven't shown what they can do design-wise, these concepts are, I think, them showing us, you know, when we're able to move on from the Karma Rivero, this is what you're going to get from us. And yeah, they're good signs. You know, it may all be vaporware, but uh, it's very pretty vaporware. Yeah, and and if it if it lends to just even portions of something that goes into production. Awesome. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'll, I'll also throw a quick shout out to the, uh, and I can't believe I'm saying this, the Lexus LC 500 convertible, that <laughs> thing. I still, you know what, if, if I can just look at it and not look at the grill, I'm just completely in love. Uh, I'm it is gorgeous. I'm so, so, so not a fan of the big grills and the spindle grills on Lexus, especially. And I still, I will go to my grave defending this, that if you just take that spindle grill and just put like a little bumper section in the middle of it, it's going to look 20,000 times better. But this thing with the drop top, it's just, uh, it, it's stunning. It is. I, the coupe is stunning. I think the grill is is beautiful myself. I think it's actually the only Lexus on which that grill looks good. I feel like they designed that car with the grill first and then tried to adapt it to every other Lexus and it just doesn't work on any of the others except this one. Uh, so yeah, it is gorgeous. I mean, the, the LC 500 itself, it looks like a concept car, you know, on the showroom floor. It's a, the, I mean, it's, it, it's sharp. I'm not sure I have your same take on that, but I mean, what, what, what are some of the cars you liked? Well, mine are actually really weird. Uh, I, I didn't include the Maki. I would have chose that if we didn't spend the whole episode talking about it. So that excluded. I picked some actually pretty normal cars that I thought were were pretty astounding for a couple of reasons. So my first one is the Toyota Rav Four Prime. Now this is the plug-in hybrid version of the Rav Four, and of course we already have a Rav Four hybrid, right? Which is just mm. you know it doesn't have a plug. The reason I think this is so interesting is because it has uh, the total system output is 302 horsepower. Isn't that number just a lot more than you would have expected? <laughs> in oh, yeah. Well, I, it, what, zero to 60 in like like under six seconds? Under six seconds. It's, it's actually, a RAV4. Yeah, they, it's actually the second quickest Toyota behind the Supra. So not even <laughs> like the 300 plus horsepower uh, Camry can, can go that fast. Uh, and again, that thanks to the electric powertrain yeah. and the torque. Um, also, uh, in addition to just the, the power and the speed, it has 39 miles of all electric range, which is really, really good. Like so many, 
um, plug-in hybrid SUVs out there are like below 20 miles yeah. in terms of range. And that's really very unlikely that I, I would say that it's unlikely most people use less than that in a day, you know, going back and forth from work. But 39 miles is a lot more to work with. I mean, that's more than the first generation Chevy Volt had. It, it feels like it's not just included as a novelty. There's actual functionality, with, actual with, functionality. That, with that sort of range. Yeah. And uh, they're saying that the actual EPA rating for it will be 90 miles per gallon equivalent. And for those who don't know, miles per gallon equivalent is the way the EPA, it's a formula the EPA uses to basically come up with a number um, so that you can compare electrified vehicles on, on an apples to apples basis with gas vehicles. But honestly, with 39 miles, again, if you live within 20 miles of your work, it's a chance that you won't be buying gas for months at a time uh, because you can go back and forth uh, to work and then plug in when you get home. So just a really impressive, Im impressive uh, specs on that. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Lincoln debuted the Corsair Grand Touring plug-in hybrid crossover. And so the Corsair is basically, um, it, it, while it's a luxury model, it's a compact SUV. So same class, same size class as the RAV4. And, you know, I was expecting really good specs from the Corsair Grand Touring because it's big brother, the Aviator Grand Touring has insane specs, like, you know, uh, tons of horsepower. I think it's almost 500 horsepower on the Aviator Grand Touring. Um, and, and just an incredible range as well. Uh, but the Corsair didn't, uh, when it came out, and I think it has somewhere in the 20 mile range. Um, and in terms of power, it's like 260 horsepower. So I, to me, this Rev4 embarrassed uh, Lincoln and their debut of the Corsair Grand Touring plug-in hybrid. So good job on Toyota for that. Um, all right, my second choice. Uh, my second choice is the 2020 Nissan Sentra. Uh, and again, this is like a bread and butter compact car. Uh, and I am not, I, I think if you know me and have heard me talk about Nissans, I'm not like a huge Nissan fanboy. I'm pretty hard on them because, you know, in, I, I think their design language has been a little bit too like techno, uh, techno Japanese. It just hasn't been my taste. And I think in general, their interiors have been kind of cheap, uh, but I really like the application of their current design language to this small car. Uh, the interior is a huge upgrade on the last Sentra. Uh, it looks like a really good option in the class, uh, and I, it impressed me. So I'm giving it the nod as well. I totally agree, and and I'm not a huge Nissan fan either. The last time I liked the Sentra was way back in the early 2000s when they had the SER Spec V. And I, I think, would go earlier than that for me. I would say the nineties when they had just the S E R. That was my, my Yeah, yeah, like 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 the early nineties. Yeah. I almost bought one of those one time. But I mean Ugh. this thing it just gorgeous. For for the small car segment, I, I, it's a standout for me. I mean, it's something that I would really consider as, as, as something, you know, right there at the top of the class. Well, at least and books. That's, it, it's very easy for cars in that class to have boring or safe designs. Yeah. And this is edgy. This is uh, attractive, bold. You know, I, it, it's almost like where they, they I think they went a little too far with the Maxima and the, and the, the kind of techno Japanese design language. And this just dials it back like two notches just to a perfect sweet spot. Uh, that I think really works. Uh, and yeah, the interior and all of the 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 new current technology it's going to get is just going to finally make it competitive in the segment, which it hasn't been for a long time. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, oh, can, I know. I know. It's been, <laughs> you're still my friend, John. You're still, you're my, still friend. my friend, too. Okay. Absolutely. And I'm glad we were able to air this out uh, in a civilized setting. Um, and we didn't even need a referee. So go awesome. on us. Um, so tell us your, uh, tell us where you're at on Twitter, Chris. Uh, I'm CH writing on Twitter. You can follow me along. Awesome. I am John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, and I want to thank you for being on this episode with me, Chris. It's, it's super pleasure. This is such a great topic. Awesome. And of course, uh, thank you out there for listening. We will see you next week. <laughs>